Ci siamo? E un prof non la sentiamo. Grazie. Okay, sì. Buona serata a tutti. Siamo contenti di questa ampia partecipazione a questo webinar organizzato congiuntamente da Sam Italy e dal, dallo SPAI, Servizio di Psicologia dell'Apprendimento e dell'Educazione in Età Evolutiva dell'Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore, di cui sono il responsabile. E ci fa piacere compiere questo ulteriore passaggio, in questa serie di, di webinar, alcuni di voi forse hanno preso parte anche a quelli precedenti, in cui stiamo invitando da eminenti studiosi stranieri a dare un loro contributo alla comprensione un po' della profilatura psicologica e anche le indicazioni poi operative che ne possono derivare ehm, che mettono a fuoco questa caratteristica particolare che alcuni bambini e ragazzi che troviamo nelle nostre scuole hanno cioè di essere da una parte affetti da un disturbo del neurosviluppo ma dall'altra parte anche avere delle doti, dei talenti particolari Oggi il focus è la dislessia ed è interessante questo passaggio che non è soltanto una restringere la lente su un, un disturbo del neurosviluppo in particolare, ma anche di fare un ulteriore passaggio rispetto all'approccio. Eh, una prima possibilità per riconoscere le caratteristiche di questi twice exceptional è quello di raccontare, di soffermarsi su casi particolari. Un secondo passaggio è quello di condurre delle ricerche sistematiche per capire quali sono i punti di forza e i punti di eccellenza che si associano a questi profili. Il terzo passaggio, che è quello che compiamo oggi, è quello di invece entrare nei meccanismi che stanno alla base di questa doppia eccezionalità. E stasera il professor Stein ci condurrà a esplorare uno specifico meccanismo che rende conto da una parte di limitazioni e dall'altra parte invece di particolari doti creative che si possono rilevare nella, nella dislessia. Prima di dare la parola alla dottoressa Milan, eh, due indicazioni pratiche. E raccomando di silenziare i microfoni in modo che non ci siano delle interferenze, a meno che vogliate poi prendere la parola per porre delle domande. Però le domande durante la, il webinar possono essere poste utilizzando la funzione eh, questions and answers che trovate nell'angolino a destra, eh, in basso, Q e uh, A. Scegliete pure l'opzione indirizza tutti, per cui se avete qualche commento eh, che volete condividere con chi sta partecipando o porre delle domande, ne prendiamo nota. E, scusi, domande scusi, potete se la in... interrompo, ma qualcuno in chat mi sta segnalando che non si riesce a sentire l'audio, quindi chiedo la cortesia a, um, ai partecipanti di scrivere nel riquadro delle domande se riescono a sentire correttamente. Ok. okay. Vedo che ci sono delle risposte affermative, quindi sembra funzionare. Per chi ha problemi di audio suggerisco di, di uscire, grazie per i feedback, eh, suggerisco di uscire e rientrare, ora lo, lo scrivo anche nei messaggi, scusi per l'interruzione. Grazie, le domande eh, non esitate anche a porle in italiano, poi ci pensiamo noi a tradurle al professor Stein e a tradurre le relative risposte. Bene, buon webinar a tutti, do la parola alla dottoressa Milan. Buonasera, buonasera a tutti, grazie al professor Antonietti per aver introdotto la tematica e per aver eh, organizzato questo nuovo incontro che eh, segue appunto gli incontri che sono già stati fatti con il professor Renzulli e la professoressa Ris e la professoressa Bom su eh, questa eh, nuova eh, per alcuni eh, realtà eh, che cercheremo in qualche modo di approfondire attraverso le esperienze eh, che eh, sono maturate all'estero e che possono raccogliere anche ovviamente eh, parte della ricerca eh, che è stata promossa e verrà eh, auspicabilmente promossa anche in Italia. Farò una traduzione sommaria, quindi non letterare per quanto riguarda il keynote speech del professore, per non togliergli eh, dello spazio prezioso. E quindi se avete qualche domanda particolare 
saremo contenti insomma di eh, delucidare i dubbi alla fine del, dell'intervento. Lascio quindi la parola al professore e lo ringrazio per la sua preziosa partecipazione. Thank you very much professor, please. Right. Um aha. There we are. Is that working? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine and Okay. Okay, now um, we can also see your slides. Good. What I'm wanting to do and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. I apologize that I I used to be able to speak some uh, Italian when I had an Italian girlfriend about 70 years ago, but um, unfortunately I've forgotten most of it. No posso parlare l'italiano adesso. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk to you about three important things about the uh, the talents and the uh, the good side of dyslexia. But to do that, what I have to do is to tell you about the crucial importance of sequencing and timing in the neural system. Uh, um, I'm going to be talking to you about magnocellular timing systems and how they are impaired in dyslexics. Then I'm going to tell you how that leads to stronger and better connected so-called parvocellular systems. And finally, I'm going to explain to you how those um, better connected parvocellular systems actually lead dyslexics to have what's called holistic perception, um, which means that they are able to see the whole of a system at one glance uh, and that is often considered a, a function of the right hemisphere now i think uh perhaps um it, the uh, the translator can translate that those three important points Sì, innanzitutto il professore eh, ringrazia per l'invito a partecipare a questo webinar e a parlare dei talenti eh, nei dislessici, ma per condurvi attraverso questo percorso dovrà affrontare la tematica da alcuni punti cardini. Il primo è il fatto che eh, nei dislessici eh, il sequencing e il timing neurale può essere ovviamente un punto di debolezza e questo punto di debolezza però viene in qualche modo eh, ribilanciato da una maggiore connettività dei sistemi eh, parvocellulari e, e questo particolare punto di forza eh, riesce a dare agli dislessici una visione olistica, cioè li mette in grado di avere una visione del quadro completo eh, più immediata rispetto alle persone eh, che non soffrono di dislessia. So now I, I want to tell you about the basis of reading, which is timing and sequencing. The point is that when children first see words, they see them as whole objects, like uh, a, a caterpillar or a mouse. They don't see them as a sequence of letters. There's no reason why they should. And they're used to seeing things like caterpillars and mice. Um, but they have to learn that words are different. They consist of a sequence of letters uh, and they have to learn how to sequence those letters in the right order. Now, this sequencing involves timing. It means timing the point at which you look at the first letter. Let's say in the word dog, you look at the D, you then move your eyes to look at the O and you then move your eyes to look at the 
G. Now that um, timing uh, is done by a, a, a system called the Magnocell system. Um, now, uh, and that enables them to order the letters in the right uh, order and uh, thus um, learn that the word consists of this series of letters. And it's only once they have learned to sequence the letters in a word that they learn that its sound can be also split into a sequence of sounds, so-called phonemes. Um, that enables them to learn what we call the phonological principle. Uh, so the magnocellular system, which times both the visual aspects of this, the movements of the eyes and the, actually the movements of your attention, uh, it also times your hearing of the different letter sounds. So you hear the order of the sounds in the word dog, d, o, g. And so these magnificellular neurons are absolutely crucial to reading. Perhaps Lara would like to translate that slide. Sure. Quando i bambini apprendono eh, a leggere e vedono le parole nel loro insieme, nella loro unità, eh, inizialmente fanno fatica a comprendere che la parola può essere in realtà suddivisa in lettere. Eh, quindi la lettura comprende sia un'abilità di eh, sequenziamento che di timing. Eh, questo processo viene eh, sviluppato grazie anche al eh, sistema magnocellulare che riesce a elaborare ehm, eh, temporalmente sia l'aspetto la, la, visivo che uditivo e eh, riescono quindi a poi eh, in qualche modo mettere in relazione la lettera al suono, cioè il, al principio eh, fonologico che eh, governa appunto la eh, comprensione e la lettura. Thank you. Now I've got to... Now, the, the, these um, magnocellular neurons are these large neurons. Can you see my cursor? Can you see? Yeah, you can. Um, these large neurons that make 10% of the, what are called the retinal ganglion cells. These are the cells that translate light into nervous impulses and their axons go into the brain and um, report or project this information into the uh, visual cortex. Now, this, um, these large ganglion cells, they're larger, they're about 50 to 100 times larger than the so-called parvo cells, the small cells. Um, and because they're large, they can conduct very fast, both conducting along their axons, but also conducting uh, from synapse to synapse. Um, but that means that, uh, that they actually, because they have a very large area from which they uh, draw their information, they're actually not very detailed in their structure. So they're good for timing, but they're not good for the detail. So they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a D and a B, for instance, because they wouldn't have the know which way around the, the bit of the D that it has a lower bit that is cur curved is on the right for a B, but on uh, on the right for a D, but on the left for a B. So they're good for timing things, but they're not good for detail. And what they do is they control the focus of attention, the visual attention, and also of eye movements. Um, and they 
contribute to what's called the dorsal wear stream, which I'll be talking about uh, in a moment. They're extremely vulnerable to drugs and disease. Uh, and I'm sure this has never happened to you, but if you take too much alcohol, what happens is one of the first things that happens is your magnocellular system ceases to work quite so well, and therefore your eyes drift apart and you see double. Um, but I'm sure you never drink enough alcohol for that to happen. Now the parvocellular neurons, these here, are far, there are a far greater number of them. Uh, they're very small, as you see here. Um, and so they're very good at the fine detail, uh, which is also called high, sensitive to high spatial frequencies. Um, uh, and they provide the main input to the uh, ventral uh, watt pathway or uh, series. So, uh, but, and they're less vulnerable. Perhaps you'd like to translate that now. Sì, allora eh, le cellule eh, magnocellulari sono delle cellule molto più grandi rispetto alle cellule parvocellulari e sono molto importanti per il timing, ma hanno una capacità di eh, definizione molto minore e quindi hanno, come dire, una eh, frequenza spaziale grossolana. Eh, L'esempio che citava il professore è quando magari uno mh, esagera con l'alcol o con le sostanze eh, dopanti eh, si nota come la visione eh, viene quasi doppiata e mh, questo per il fatto che pur essendo eh, così grandi sono molto più vulnerabili mentre le eh, cellule parvocellulari che sono più piccole hanno però in realtà eh, una caratteristica di avere una capacità di invece eh, dettagliare eh, le, la visione gli oggetti sono però um, sono quindi meno vulnerabili oh no um what is now about 50 years ago um myself and a friend um dear Mitchell Glickstein, we discovered that the magna cells that we I'm talking about provide the main input to this dorsal wear pathway. So the magna cells are these red cells here. They project via this uh, area here called the lateral geniculate nucleus, the magna cellular layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And they give provide the main input, 90% of the input to the this dorsal pathway. Uh, and they're important for controlling eye movements. Um, I, I don't think we need to translate that because it's not that, uh, I mean, it's important, but it's not, not difficult to understand. We'll move to the next slide. Um, and the important thing here is that this timing system, this magnocellular timing system, are very much less well developed in dyslexics. The, they are 30% smaller uh, when you uh, measure their size in this relay nucleus called the lateral geniculate nucleus. They uh, are, have reduced uh, activation of the, they produce uh, reduced activation of the visual motion sensitive cortex. Um, they uh, are, have reduced, they produce reduced and delayed uh, visual evoked potentials, that is the brain waves responding to of the input of a visual system, uh, input. Um, they are less sensitive to visual movement. 
they are less sensitive to contrast and uh, to uh, flicker. Um, and they, their in pair development causes the control of the eye movements to be unstable. But that's not only true of the visual side, but they are, it's also true in the auditory side. So the um, dyslexics have smaller uh, auditory magnocells. Uh, they have uh, smaller auditory magnocells in the what's called the ma medial geniculate nucleus, which is the thalamic equivalent of the lateral geniculate nucleus, the auditory equivalent to the visual lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, they have less, they are less sensitive to changes in the amplitude or the frequency of sounds. Those are called amplitude or frequency modulations, AM and FM. Um, those things are true uh, in uh, the uh, in, in dyslexics, but the the sensitivity of the uh, uh, two auditory modulation uh, amplitude and frequency modulations predict uh, the phonological abilities of everybody. So, uh, in dyslexics who have reduced sensitivity of these auditory magno cells, uh, they are uh, therefore doubly affected. Would you like to translate that? Eh, sì, eh, quanto il professore ha eh, relazionato e eh, ri, riassunto in questa slide eh, in cui si parla appunto di come i sistemi di, mai, di timing magnocellulare siano meno sviluppati in questi bambini, ma eh, questo diciamo, eh, problema si ripercuote non solo nelle magnocellule visive che sono più piccole del 30%, ma anche nelle magnocellule uditive. Eh, sicuramente eh, questa, questi due aspetti eh, si, eh, si, si, in qualche modo si eh, riscontrano eh, in questi eh, bambini eh, e questi eh, si ripercuotono anche nella eh, diversa sensibilità eh, nelle variazioni di ampiezza e frequenza, cioè nelle modulazioni di eh, ampiezza e frequenza appunto che eh, segnalano i suoni eh, della lettera. Quindi queste sensibilità predicono anche le loro capacità fonologiche che sono inferiori ovviamente eh, nei, nei bambini dislessici. So the visual uh, instability that happens in dyslexics means that this word dog is appears to uh, dyslexics very often as this very uh, difficult word to read uh, because the two eyes are not working perfectly together. Vedete come ad esempio nella slide precedente e la lettura di una parola semplice come dog possa essere difficile per un dislessico. This is evidence that shows that the magno cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus that I mentioned earlier are uh, smaller and more dis disturbed in dyslexics than controls. This is in fact um, uh, a, a, um, a slide of a, a brain, of the brain of a dyslexic compared to the slide of a normal 70 year old control. And you can see there's a clear difference. And in fact, these neurons are smaller uh, and are more dis disturbed they they grow into the wrong places than is the case in the uh in, in the uh control brain do you want to 
Sì, vediamo questa risonanza magnetica che può in qualche modo esemplificare quanto spiegato finora, come e nella destra vediamo una eh, rappresentazione delle magnocellule eh, visive eh, in un cervello dislessico e eh, come invece sono più eh, grandi e più dettagliate eh, nel, eh, nella figura di sinistra eh, di controllo. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that dyslexia is hereditary. Uh, the, heredit uh, the heritability of dyslexia is uh, about 60%, which means that 60% of the variation in people's reading ability is a consequence of uh, their genetic uh, inheritance. Um, uh, that means that dyslexia is highly uh, neurobiological. It's not uh, purely psychological, as some people would claim. Now, I'm going to talk to you about two particular genes, but just briefly about this one on chromosome 18. And the only reason I'm mentioning it is that we discovered it, and it is actually a gene that is probably uh, related to the importance of consuming enough essential fatty acid, omega-3s. I'm not going to talk about that at all unless people are interested in it, but just to say that um, eating uh, enough, uh, uh, enough omega-3s, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, can help many dyslexics. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not what this lecture is about. I'm actually going to be talking to you about this gene KIAA0319, which is another one we discovered. Um, I don't know that you need to translate that, but uh, because what hey, I'm going to. Yeah, hey, okay. Uh, can, you, can you go back a little bit, please? Slide yeah. before. Um, yeah. Il professore ci parla oggi uh, anche del fatto che eh, ormai è. è comunemente eh, condivisa eh, la concezione che la dislessia sia eh, ereditaria, quindi abbia una forte base neurobiologica. In particolare il professore ha evidenziato, eh, perché è stato scoperto grazie alle sue ricerche, l'importanza eh, del cromosoma 18 e, e in qualche modo eh, si eh, evidenziava il fatto che l'assunzione regolare di omega da tre dovrebbe in qualche modo uh, aiutare i dislessici. I'm now going to talk to you about um, the other gene that we discovered, KIA0319, because it controls the migration of neurons during the first, uh, yeah, dur during um, uh, the development of the brain in, ut in uh, utero. Um, and to do this, I want to show the effects of knocking out uh, this gene just locally in the, the cerebral cortex. I'm not, uh, uh, this is not what happens in dyslexics, but it shows you what the importance of uh, this gene is uh, in, in all animals. This was actually done in rats. Um, so if you knock out this gene, what happens is the normal way in which neurons migrate is that the neurons get born in what's called the ventricular zone. They then migrate up the uh, radial glia, the blue uh, dendrite here, and they form six layers in the uh, cerebral cortex. And you can see this happening here in the control brain. But if you knock out this gene, KIO319, which you can do locally nowadays, uh, you can see that the, gene, the, the, the cells are born okay in the ventricular zone, but they don't migrate normally. Now, nobody's suggesting that that's what happens in dyslexia, but what it does show is that this gene is, does control, help to control actually, the um, migration of these neurons. 
and uh, in dyslexics, it is about 30% less expressed. Uh, so it's, it has some part to play in the mismigration of neurons in dyslexics. Would you like to translate that? Sì, un'altra importante scoperta del, della ricerca del professore si concentra sul eh, gene eh, 0319 che controlla la migrazione neuronale durante la fase iniziale dello sviluppo del cervello eh, in utero. E questo non è esattamente una rappresentazione di ciò che eh, accade, ma è una rappresentazione grafica di come eh, la, ehm, la migrazione di questo eh, neurone eh, possa in qualche modo eh, deprimere questa, eh, questo sviluppo. Now, the, the first thing I want to say about the care of 0319, or another thing I want to say about it, is that it, if you look at these yellow blobs here, this show you the uh, amount of uh, expression of that particular gene in, uh, this again is in rats, and, you can, uh, and if you trace these down, you can see that actually they all relate to important parts of that dorsal root that I was talking about. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, this, this has got moved. Actually, if we moved it over here, it would be overlying these yellow dots, which means that this gene is highly expressed in that dorsal uh, stream that I was talking about earlier. Lara. Se notiamo i pallini gialli che formano in qualche modo, se uniti tra loro, una linea eh, crescente, eh, notiamo appunto come questo particolare eh, eh, gene eh, sia eh, molto eh, presente nel flusso dorsale e questo aiuta a controllarne lo sviluppo. Ah. That didn't work. What's happened? <laughs> it's not um, advancing. Now, can anybody suggest a reason? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, now, th there are three dyslexia genes that have been discovered so far. Okay. The one I've talked about. DC, DC2, DC2, and Robo, and they control the migration of the neurons, as I said, early in development. But they also are involved in immunity and in setting up speech laterality, the way in which the left hemisphere is for speech, the right hemisphere is more for vi visuospatial kinds of things. Um, and we'll be talking about that later. The other thing is that um, the mismigration of cells that occurs in dyslexics, uh, this is shown uh, by this, um, this uh, uh, slide here, which shows what are called ectopias. These ectopias uh, happen as a result of uh, the uh, under expression of KIO319 and possibly the other two genes, um, and they're very characteristic of dyslexia. This is a dyslexic brain which has these ectopias very much more uh, to, to be seen in the left hemisphere than the right hemisphere. Lara? Sì, l'importanza di questi tre geni nella dislessia, quelli di cui abbiamo parlato finora, eh, è determinata dal fatto che controllano la migrazione neuronale e causano delle eh, ectopie, come vediamo nella figura di destra, che è appunto eh, una eh, rappresentazione di un eh, dislessico. I don't know why we're getting this now. I suppose because the picture has been selected and you are moving the picture 
maybe you have to press uh, in a part of the oh so i suppose that now yeah you can... you're right you're right sorry <laughs> thank you um so um despite their reading problems dyslexia dyslexic people are often remarkably successful and people absolutely ignore this uh, for some reason everybody wants to know that dyslexics have problems they don't seem to be interested in dyslexic talents but i'm always interested in them because it, it's quite strong in my family though i i don't have it myself um and so i've given you a few statistics here it's four times commoner in London art students than it is in the general population. It's 10 times more pop, uh, common in uh, the uh, Swedish art students than it is in other students in the university. It's 35 times more common, get that, 35 times more common in uh, entrepreneurial millionaires than it is amongst their managers and i'll come back to that in a moment and so it's probably it's probably because dyslexics often develop superior holistic cognitive skills and that's really what i'm going to be talking about next i think they've all understood that so i don't, i won't uh, ask to translate it you will all know that there are many, many famous dyslexics. And perhaps my favorite is actually um, Caesar Augustus. Uh, Suetonius, Suetonius gives a description of his problems with reading, and uh, he almost certainly was dyslexic. Leonardo da Vinci was almost certainly dyslexic. George Washington was, Michael Faraday, who uh, is a famous physicist who really invented electricity. You all have heard of Auguste Rodin, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who um, uh, made a corner in oil, a great, great um, uh, uh, a person to give money for, to charity, very, very philanthropic person. Pablo Picasso, almost certainly dyslexic. Albert Einstein, and we may come back to him, Hans Christian Andersen, the uh, children's writer, Winston Churchill, Richard Branson is a millionaire in our country, in the UK, Whoopi Goldberg, I'm sure you've all heard of, and these two uh, um, actors. Uh, and these are some, oh, well, there's, uh, there's Rodin, Picasso, Winston Churchill, Actually, this is new Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Whoopi Goldberg. Um, and these dyslexia, these people are all people who have very, were very, very um, talented. My main point at this point is that dyslexia genes wouldn't be so common if they didn't endow some selective advantages. And many dyslexics are unusually creative and excel when holistic thinking is required, as in politics. Now, something like 10% of the population has dyslexia. It's the most common developmental abnormality. And as I say, dyslexia variant genes would not be so common unless they conser conferred considerable advantages. And what they do is they uh, disrupt M cell neuronal migration, as I've told you, early in uh, brain development. And also, I haven't had time to tell you about this, that many, many of these genes actually affect immune function. Um, uh, so many dyslexics have problems with their immune system. So you just thought it was all bad news. Uh, 
but many many dyslexics that I say are very successful, and that's probably because impaired uh, M cell function gives right gives the space for uh, parvocellular cells to substitute for them, and so they develop much stronger parvocellular connectivity. Again, I think it, that's obvious. Um, the 90% of the, well, it's actually 70% of the cells um, which are, uh, oh, sorry, come again. 90% of the cells uh, in the feet that are born in the fetus are destroyed during later development. Uh, they only survive if they make useful connections. In dyslexics, because they grow fewer and smaller M cells, their parvo cells win the developmental connection uh, competition with M cells. And what that means is that more survive and develop more connections. These enhanced uh, P systems, parvocellular system, mediate better holistic processing. And that means better right hemisphere um, skills. This why it explains why dyslexics show superior holistic thinking. And that it gives them their greater um, creative skills. Um, but of course, they have worse linear sequencing. But those creative and holistic skills mean they make good artists, good engineers, uh, they're good system analysis and they are make great entrepreneurs as i told you 35 times more millionaires than you'd expect are uh, dyslexic uh, again i don't think you need to translate that because i've just gone through it now this i think you will have to translate um I just briefly want to talk to you about how this leads to uh, the evidence uh, that the dyslexics have superior fine detail uh, vision. And fine detail is co sometimes called high spatial frequency. Um, so this is to show you the evidence that they have high spatial frequency sensitivity. So this is a picture of uh, Albert Einstein, but it has been filtered in such a way that only the low frequencies get through. And you can see that it's Albert Einstein, but actually dyslexics will be less good at seeing that than would good readers. This shows the same picture, but now filtered so that all the low spatial frequency, all the coarse lines, as it were, are removed, but only the fine ones remain. And what this panel here shows is that whilst dyslexics, uh, the dotted lines, are worse at low spatial frequencies, which are carried out by the magnet cells, they're actually quite a lot better at high spatial frequencies, which are carried out by the parvo cells. So that's suggesting strongly that dyslexics have more or better parvo cells than uh, do uh, ordinary readers, uh, whereas they have uh, worse magna cell low spatial frequency um, abilities. Would you like to translate that? 
Uh, I dislessici hanno una capacità di, vede di vedere i dettagli eh, meglio rispetto alle eh, persone che non soffrono di dislessia e questo è dovuto a quella che viene anche con chiamata un'alta frequenza spaziale. E se guardiamo le due figure, la figura B mostra un'immagine eh, chiaramente di Einstein ma con una bassa frequenza spaziale, cosa che eh, i eh, dislessici fanno fatica però a riconoscere. La stessa eh, figura eh, per i dislessici risulta più eh, visibile nella figura C che ha invece un'altra frequenza spaziale. E questo dimostra appunto che hanno una maggiore e più elevata sensibilità alle alte frequenze rispetto ai lettori normali. Thank you. Now this, this I don't think you'll need to translate because... Oops, what's happened? There we are. Uh, This uh, you won't uh, uh, need to translate because although it looks very complicated, the only point I want to make is that whilst the magno stream, which should be down here, is uh, extremely simple and it just goes directly from the visual cortex forward towards the frontal lobes to control eye movements and, and attention, the um, parvo stream is. Uh, is much more extensive. It's, uh, it, it, this shows you the degree of extension. This is the same. Um, I don't think that, that noise is coming from me. Um, uh, se qualcuno ha il microfono acceso, chiedo di renderlo muto. I'm sorry for the interruption, go on. Okay, well, anyway, um, all I want to show you is that the power cellular system is very much more interconnected uh, that uh, so i don't think uh, lara needs to translate that and we'll see if i can move it on so the point here is that holistic visual processing depends upon this parvocellular system and the reason it's holistic is because of that huge interconnectedness of the parvocellular system so what i've shown you so far is that dyslexics have a weak magnocellular system but a stronger parvocellular system that's more interconnected and that enables them to have these holistic uh, uh these holistic um kind of uh of um talents the 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 p cells are more branched more they have more synapses and uh they have very they have this very very wide ranging uh connectivity lara eh, abbiamo finora appunto visto come i dislessici abbiano una visione olistica eh, più forte e questo eh, dipende eh, ovviamente da una maggiore eh, presenza delle eh, cellule parvocellulari. Per cui questa eh, è una, eh, così, una rappresentazione della via dorsale che ha una eh, connettività che è... Eh, Hello. Oh. Okay, okay. Uh, Lara, adesso dovresti essere collegata. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, no. um, Vai pure, so, Lara. È terminato. Okay, scusa. Okay. Um, so now what I'm going to do is to show you more evidence that this superior connectivity of the p-cell system in dyslexics um, uh, gives rise to talents that people don't talk about. Um, first of all, I, uh, I can't show you this in a picture, 
but it's it's clear that dyslexics have a, 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 uh, have superior color di discrimination, particularly in the peripheral field. And that's very relevant to art, for instance, where if you want to see the composition, you've got to be able to, uh, if you want to uh, understand the composition and create a well composed picture, you've got to be able to see not just where you're looking, but uh, some way away from where you're looking, what is going on uh, and be able to put it all together to see the whole uh, composition that you have in your mind in one glance. And so uh, color discrimination in, that is superior in the peripheral field is something that obviously will lead to superior artists' abilities. 3D visualization is another thing that um, uh, uh, dyslexics are good at. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a, seri a, a famous architect in the UK called Richard Rogers, who is himself dyslexic, and he likes to have dyslexics in his drawing um, uh, office because they are much better at 3D visualization, seeing how a two-dimensional uh, diagram on a, 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 as a plan will convert to a 3D building. Um, they can see it all at once. Uh, they're better at figure from ground. They're better at impossible figures, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, and also pattern matching. And all these talents require an, uh, the ability to see holistic visuospatial things rather than linear rather than just having a linear sequential working memory lara quello che magari forse non tutti sanno è che appunto i dislessici hanno una particolare eh, abilità artistica e questa abilità artistica è, è ricorrente e presente in moltissimi artisti che eh, riescono ad avere eh, delle visioni eh, delle loro opere eh, che mh, partendo anche dai piccoli dettagli riescono però ad immaginare eh, l'opera eh, nella sua eh, completezza vedendo anche eh, i particolari, particolari nuance di colori ma soprattutto vedendo in 3D trovando anche un senso a quelle che noi consideriamo le figure impossibili che eh, vedremo nelle prossime slides e riuscendo anche a tracciare una corrispondenza tra i vari partners. Quindi la visione, la, visu la percezione visospaziale olistica nei, nei bambini eh, dislessici è, è molto più eh, elevata. So this shows you one of the um, talents that dyslexics have and that has been measured. This is what's called figure from ground. So I can see, but uh, some people might not be able to see this, the love in that picture. And you can reduce the number of coherent spots so that the, it is less and less easy to see but dyslexics will tolerate few, having fewer coherent spots than uh, uh, ordinary readers. So dyslexics can see that when I can only see the, uh, the background spots. Um, so you can test their ability uh, by re reducing the number of spots that are forming the letters. Lara? Questa slide fa eh, vedere come eh, i dislessici siano in grado di eh, leggere la scritta love anche riducendo il numero di puntini che sono eh, diciamo ehm, concentrati nelle lettere che formano questa parola ed è un test che viene utilizzato eh, appunto per testare eh, i bambini. Now, this is my favorite kind of test, and the one that most has been most uh, popular 
for testing dyslexics um uh holistic skills these are uh impossible figures i'm not uh uh, uh dyslexics are much better at seeing that this uh, actually is impossible um and i'm going to just show you two others simply because i like them uh, here's another escher here's sharp's bookshelf uh, uh, an impossible thing that you could, couldn't possibly make uh, and this is actually on a swedish i discovered on a swedish po postage stamp i don't know why it was there um but these are all impossible figures so finally i'm going to show you uh, why we think dyslexics are better at it. So here's another, the famous trident, which is impossible. But here's here's a particular one where we can show you. If you're me, to show, to find out, to to, to demonstrate that it's impossible to uh, to make this particular object, if you, you have to look there and then look there and then see that the two don't fit that can't be the same so somehow at here it's at the it's a space but then suddenly when you move to the other side it's an edge so there's uh that's an impossible figure well dyslexics are much quicker at spotting that that's an impossible figure than ordinary people like me and that has been done by at least three separate sets of people. And I think everybody <laughs> believes it now. Ara? <laughs> Abbiamo visto delle figure impossibili che sono tra le preferite del professore che vengono sottoposte ai bambini dislessici. Mentre per un, eh, una persona che eh, non soffre di dislessia eh, è difficile riuscire a comprendere diciamo, le strutture di queste figure, un dislessico ha una percezione eh, visiva molto più eh, chiara e, e impiega meno tempo a comprendere che in realtà queste figure sono impossibili da realizzare. Now it's often suggested that dyslexics take up art, entrepreneurialism, etc., simply because they're bad at reading. But that seems highly unlikely. I mean, the the sort of people I showed you, like um uh like uh, Einstein or uh, Rodin or um, Spielberg, they obviously had to do a lot of reading for whatever they were, uh, for their art or their um, uh, making, uh, directing cinemas, etc. So it's not likely that they are taking it up simply because there's less reading. In fact, I'm arguing that they are more creative because they're better at um, at this holistic perception. And it's this holistic perception that is uh, mediated and made possible by their, their superior parvo-solar connectivity. Lara? Ci si può chiedere perché eh, tanti artisti e tanti imprenditori abbiano intrapreso questa carriera e, e qualcuno potrebbe anche pensare perché queste sono carriere in cui magari non è così richiesta la capacità di lettura. In realtà no, eh, eccellono in questi ambiti perché hanno appunto una percezione olistica migliore. So why are dyslexics so often successful? I've t told you the background, but there are other things that follow from this as well. For instance, long experience of having to work harder um, than others because they've had to find creative ways around their problems will sharpen up their creative abilities. Also, they've had to develop skills at delegating tasks 
they they're bad at, and this will uh, will have um, will have uh, improved their um, ability to delegate uh, and uh, their uh, people sp skills. They uh, and that's why they're highly people uh, friendly, uh, and how they can develop that kind of people friendliness. Um, and they have extraordinary good uh, communi oral communications, even though they can't read so well. Um, and they're actually twice as likely to own their own businesses. Maybe, maybe it, the people said that was because you had to own your own business and therefore could afford a secretary so that you wouldn't have to read but i think that's a very minor uh, reason behind it um and none of these things explain why they can develop these talents yet uh, dyslexics can but other people can't and as i say it's probably because their brains develop the stronger parvocellular connectivity hence their superior holistic rather than ordinary linear sequential styles. Lara? I think it's all uh, written, but... Uh, yeah. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Um, and so I'll go through this as well. Um, they, they think visually um, and they imagine uh not with word they don't need words they see the big picture at once they have vivid imaginations because they uh, can see this pictures all the time they can create a complete mental picture from from the pieces by immediately seeing how they all fit together they have great imagination and they uh, tend to day, daydream uh, they, and that is because they've got better employment uh, of the brain's ability to alter and create new perceptions all tied up with their parvocellular strength and that makes them more creative makes them more intuitive um, insight and that makes them insightful and curious about how things work uh, as i said before they can see and think in three dimensions uh, and they can see things that others don't um, they can see a complete patterns uh, and they and impo importantly they can see when things don't work together this is very off-putting there's noise uh yeah i'm sorry but everyone has the microphone muted so i'm not sure what's the cause of it sounds it's probably some technical problems oh, well, but it's not due to sounds as those people are dying in the background <laughs> they're not anyway. everyone is muted so i'm not sure uh they have a wide spatial span of attention and that gives them heightened awarenesses not just of what they're looking at but at everything and this makes the the good at multitasking uh so they are highly productive and constantly thinking of new things um th they have to have uh gener uh, uh, developed a capacity to make rapid decisions and this means that they're natural leaders. They're practical uh, uh, because they learn best by doing things rather than by reading or lectures. Um, uh, and it's often said they see problems as if they're looking down from a helicopter and they see the whole forest of problems and see exactly what's missing or what the relationships between things are again i don't think it's necessary to translate that because i've just uh, been through it uh through what's on the slide 
It's all translated, yes. Yeah. Um, now, I think this is a really important one uh, because the dyslexic's superior P parvocellular system and their connectivity allow, uh, endowing them with this strong holistic kind of cognitive skills allow them to fully utilize all aspects of their personality, their intellect, emotions, imagination, their body and their feelings all together for more effective and comprehensive understanding. And this enables them to understand con, uh, complex systems faster and see the many different types of relationships within the complex system and their many elements and to perceive the whole, the whole character of the thing they're looking at through rapidly perceiving their large scale patterns and thus they can easily more easily than ordinary people spot crucial errors and that's one thing that uh, they are often uh, say about themselves um, thus dyslexics people skill this is an actual example um, they can read a person's personality quickly and without apparent effort they're able to integrate all they know all they've experienced and ha heard about them to form an accurate judgment. So that wh when I've been talking about the visuospatial uh, parvo system, I've been talking just about vision, but actually it, it goes, it, it abstracts to much more, um, much more abstract uh, kinds of uh, of abilities. Perhaps, Lara, you can just talk about that. Sì, abbiamo appunto visto tutte le caratteristiche positive dei uh, dislessici e, e in particolar modo di come questi aspetti di questa visione olistica um, permettano anche loro di trarre delle conclusioni anche veloci e molto concrete, eh, ad esempio eh, nel giudicare una persona, quindi una visione di insieme. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that dyslexics have different but not impaired brains. I've shown you about their magna weakness, um, which leads them to have this poor linear sequencing, uh, and that's bad for reading. Uh, but this means uh, that their parvo systems dominate. So they tend to have superior holistic talents, um, hence greater creativity, as I've explained. And this explains why their magnocellular impairment has remained in the human genome, because if it uh, was wholly bad, then the genes would have disappeared, the gene variants would have disappeared. Um, and I always end by saying we need to nurture, not disapprove or uh, condemn our dyslexics. We need them urgently because they have the imagination and the originality and their the ability to spot the patterns which are going to get us out of our messes. That's, if you'd like to translate, uh, but you probably don't need to, but um, anyway, do so. <laughs> Sì, naturalmente a conclusione di quanto esposto durante questo interessantissimo intervento eh, possiamo appunto riassumere che eh, nei dislessici i talenti e la creatività sono veramente presenti e come in realtà questo eh, danno, danno magno cellulare eh, non sia eh, stato eh, in qualche modo, eh, non, non sia scomparso eh, perché il genoma umano 
umano l'ha mantenuto. Questo per eh, dire ancora una volta che eh, non dobbiamo giudicare o eh, disapprovare i dislessici, dobbiamo piuttosto trovare il modo per eh, supportare eh, questi studenti e, e in quanto abbiamo tutti bisogno della loro grande dote di immaginazione e anche eh, di originalità. So that's all I have to say. I hope I've convinced you that dyslexics are, have very, very re remarkable talents. Thank you. Il professore ringrazia e conclude dicendo che questa, questo suo intervento spera abbia avuto la capacità di convincervi che i dislessici sono veramente persone di grande talento. Thank you, professor Stein. Thank you for your speech, which was very insightful, and also for the positive perspective on dyslexia you suggested. I realized that in the chat some uh, questions have been asked. So if you agree, I can try to, yeah. to translate them. Yeah. Uh, one question was about the link between empathy and um, uh, the holistic uh, view. Maybe that empathy can be seen as an aspect of this uh, holistic uh, skill uh, of dyslexics. Yes, yeah. um, I think empathy is very important. I ought to have included that because empathy means being able to see things from somebody else's point of view. And that enables you to um, uh, be much better at understanding somebody else, which is, so it adds to the, um, to the people uh, talents that many dyslexics have. And it definitely comes from this, uh, this holistic way of thinking, which is, um, is facilitated by this highly connected parvocellular system. Sì, allora il professore risponde che effettivamente l'empatia può essere collegata a questa eh, capacità olistica dei dislessici, in quanto l'empatia consiste appunto nel saper interpretare le cose dal punto di vista di un'altra persona e quindi sicuramente questa è una caratteristica eh, comune nei dislessici. Another question was about uh, the possibility to extend uh, what you told about uh, dyslexia to the other learning disabilities. This perspective is true also for other learning disabilities. Um, well, the one that I would like to talk about is autism. Uh, which isn't usually considered a learning disability, but often has a learning disability as part of its um, features, because it's quite clear that uh, or the um, disturbance of the magnocellular system is also found in autism. It's not a major feature of autism, but it is found in them, and therefore um, there are characteristics of what are called high functioning autistic uh, people that are uh, quite similar to those of dyslexics. Il professore ritiene che appunto alcune di queste caratteristiche possono essere comuni anche ai soggetti eh, che soffrono di autismo, uh, sebbene ovviamente l'autismo non sia un una uh, difficoltà di apprendimento, ma eh, sicuramente eh, è una caratteristica che possiamo ritrovare nei bambini autistici ad alto funzionamento. Along the same line, uh, Raffaella is asking if also people with dysgraphia, dyspraxia or with disorders in orthography or also dyscalculia can be advantaged in the holistic um, processing system? Well, um, 
let me talk about dysgraphia and dyspraxia first. Um, both dysgraphia and dys, uh, dyspraxia are um, very much related to uh, dyslexia. In fact, uh, most, no, I would say many dyslexics have dysgraphia and many have dyspraxia. So they're a sort of uh, subgroup of dyslexics. And uh, it's been shown that they have uh, disturb, uh, a, a, a impaired Magnus of their systems and the likelihood is therefore that they have uh, superior parvocellular systems, uh, just as I've described for dyslexic. Um, in the case, what what was the uh, what was the last per last um, uh, condition you mentioned? Uh, uh, dyscalculia. Uh, dyscalculia. Yeah, dyscalculia is slightly different um, because it very much depends. Uh, what you mean by dyscalculia. True dyscalculia, where you lack the ability to understand numbers at all, um, is not part of dyslexia. But uh, what is often called dyscalculia is a consequence of uh, a dyslexic's ability, inability to get the numbers in the right order, for instance. So it's it's a consequence of the um, poor sequencing of dyslexia. And that kind of dyscalculia, which I personally don't think should be called dyscalculia, is uh, again a subgroup of dyslexics. But true dyscalculia is a different kind of thing altogether. Allora, eh, sicuramente eh, bisogna fare delle, dei distinguo. La dislessia e la dispraxia possono essere eh, ovviamente correlati alla eh, dislessia e quindi questo eh, sistema magnocellulare eh, depresso eh, può avere eh, appunto degli effetti anche nei dislessici eh, e quindi avere una eh, correlazione. E, per quanto riguarda la discalculia il professore fa uh, un distinguo eh, in quanto considera una forma di discalculia quella che è determinata quindi dalla incapacità di eh, codificare i numeri eh, relativa alla incapacità dei dislessici di eh, sequenziare le lettere quindi sicuramente per questa far, eh, parte eh, o forma di discalculia che lui non chiamerebbe neanche discalculia eh, sì c'è una correlazione A lot of questions have been asked in the chat. Uh, maybe I missed some questions. One is uh, about uh, the relationships between dyslexia and music. Uh, Lucia is asking if this uh, skill uh, uh, consisting in being able to view uh, from uh, an upper point uh, of view is uh, um, similar to the ability to, to perceive a musical piece uh, as a rule? Yes, I'm, I'm very pleased that question was asked um, because there are a lot of very, very musical dyslexics. However, the giveaway is that they're very, usually very poor at sight reading because sight reading demands sequencing the notes not only from left to right but also from top to bottom uh, superior and inferior um, and so sight reading is a real pain for dyslexics and many dyslexic musicians have to learn the the um, the the score uh, by heart uh, and they find it very difficult to sight read but the reason they make really good musicians is because they, as you so rightly say, can see how the whole uh, piece should fit together. And therefore, um, as I said at one point, they can see the 
for, for notes, as it were, fr from a helicopter and see how they all uh, go from one kind of uh, uh, mood to another uh, and can see where things don't fit in. So it's a holistic in the auditory sense. Il professore ringrazia per questa interessante domanda eh, nella correlazione tra dislessia e musica, in quanto eh, è vero, ci sono molti musicisti di talento che sono dislessici, quindi sicuramente hanno, eh, come eh, aveva già descritto prima, la capacità eh, di vedere eh, l'opera nella sua interezza, con eh, quell'immagine che ci aveva regalato il professore della visione da un elicottero, quindi vedere tutte le parti dell'opera che eh, si armonizzano per diventare un tutto. Quello che però alcuni eh, musicisti dislessici difettano è la capacità di leggere la musica nello spartito e quindi molti musicisti devono memorizzare la partitura per poter eh, poi eh, suonare. Um. My colleague, Professor Raino, wrote in the chat a series of comments uh, just uh, supporting the, the message you provided. Uh, according to her experience, uh, it is really true that uh, people with dyslexia are inhibited in processing in a sequential way different kinds of stimuli, but uh, they are more skilled in, uh, in empathy and in personal relationships. And Gianluca asked his question in English, so I just uh, read it. If uh, dyslexics are more likely to develop other kinds of talent, like holistic reasoning or creative thinking, what role do the environment play in inhibiting those potentials? Well, that, again, that's a really important question. I always say that dyslexics can be very successful at whatever they choose to do so long as they can get through their schooling um, because the environment um, can be very inhibiting of their particular ways of thinking the environment of a school in particular because by and large school teachers don't understand people who don't think in a linear se sequencing way and they can be inhibited and therefore their talents can be not mature. That's why I ended up by saying uh, we must new, uh, we, we should, um, uh, we should uh, um, nurture our uh, dyslexics and not, not uh, criticize them. Ancora una volta il professore ringrazia per questa interessante domanda in quanto eh, sostiene che i dislessici possono essere bravi in qualsiasi cosa decidano di fare se sopravvivono l'esperienza scolastica in quanto l'ambiente scolastico può inibire alcune eh, delle loro potenzialità. Eh, Alcuni insegnanti potrebbero non capire che non hanno questo, uh, questa capacità di sequenziamento uh, e che quindi uh, dovrebbero cercare in qualche modo di venire incontro alle loro esigenze e nutrire i loro talenti. Daniela is asking something more about uh, uh, the relationships between dyslexia and the omega 3. And what? Uh, the fat acid and the treatment based on uh, omega 3. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to hear about that. Um, the, the, the point here is that right at the beginning, I said magno cells are extremely vulnerable. And one of the things they're vulnerable is lack of long chain uh, of central fatty acids in the diet, which normally come from fish. And the reason is that they are large and they conduct fast. And this means that they have to have um, ionic channels that can open and close very fast. And the environment of these ionic channels 
has to have enough of a particular omega-3, docosahexaenoic acid, which is has got um, uh, 22 carbon atoms um, and six double bonds. Um, and that particular length of fatty acid fits into the membrane perfectly and allows the um, the ionic channels to open and close fast. But unfortunately, well, uh, you lose about five milligrams of your DHA every day. So it has to be replaced. Now, if you don't eat enough fish, it is very unlikely that it will be replaced with proper long chain omega-3 DHA, but it's more likely under a modern diet to be replaced by omega-6 um, uh, arachidonic acid, which w fits the same space as it were, but it isn't, it, it, it stiffens up the membrane and it slows down the omega, uh, the um, ionic channels. Um, and so if you've got a slightly uh, impaired magnocellular system but because of your genes, as it were, as dyslexics have, then often you can pep them up a bit by making sure that they have enough omega-3s in their diet, enough DHA in the diet. There are other reasons, but I don't have time to go into it, but that's the most important one. Riassumo eh, la risposta del professore che effettivamente si sì, eh, ribadisce che l'assunzione di omega 3, eh, omega 3 eh, sicuramente potrebbe eh, aiutare i dislessici. Eh, l'assunzione dell'omega 3 purtroppo non è così regolare nella nostra dieta in quanto magari non mangiamo eh, così spesso il pesce e quindi si dovrebbe integrare. Se ciò non avviene eh, il diciamo l'apporto di omega 3 può essere in qualche modo ehm, sostituito dagli omega 6 che però la, rallentano le funzioni delle membrane e quindi si consiglia appunto di eh, assumere l'omega 3. E a questo riguardo se posso aggiungere una piccola chiosa sotto la supervisione della dottoressa Lorusso che ho visto essere connessa presso l'istituto Medea in corso una sperimentazione proprio sugli effetti sui bambini con dislessia di un integratore alimentare a base di omega 3 e quando i risultati saranno acquisiti si potrà aggiungere anche questo piccolo pezzo di informazione. E le domande sono veramente tante, leggo l'ultima, poi magari chiedo anche alla dottoressa Cancer che magari ha il controllo sulla chat magari di recuperare qualche domanda precedente che mi è sfuggita. Eh, una è questa, anche qui è già in inglese, così la scelgo che non faccio fatica di tradurla. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned some connections between dyslexia and the immunity. Could there be, in, in this perspective of neurobiological inheritance, a connection between self-immune diseases of the mother and dyslexia in the child? There certainly can. Um... It's a very big story, which is why I didn't go into it. But let me say the first thing is the gene that I referred to, KIAA0319, actually sits in the middle of what's called the major histocompatibility gene uh, system, which is on the short arm of chromosome six. Uh, and it, it, some people treat it as one of the uh, uh, immune control genes. Now we know that uh, the Magna cells um, are, produce an antigen called, which is known as CAT301, um, because it was discovered in cats, uh, that identifies them and um, we, among others, have found that actually 
some mothers, particularly if they um, have uh, more than one dyslexic child, produce antibodies to that particular um, protein uh, that uh, can uh, give rise to um, damage to the magnet cells. And that means that uh, that is associated with dyslexics in general having a higher rate of autoimmune disease, um, such as asthma, a eczema, and indeed one of them, uh, uh, which is called lupus. Um, so there is a tie up with immunity. Riassumo e non entro nei dettagli. Eh, sicuramente c'è una relazione, eh, quindi una correlazione tra il, la dislessia e, e il, il sistema immunitario depresso. Alcune madri eh, di molti figli eh, dislessici possono anche sviluppare degli anticorpi, ma eh, in generale si può riscontrare che alcuni dislessici possono avere eh, delle eh, forme di asma o anche di eczema. Ok, uh, ci sono altre quattro domande, se il professor Stein è ancora disponibile. If you are available, there are also other four questions, if you're still available to answer them. Yeah, yeah. Ok, and I think that's the last ones. Um, a couple of people asked about gifted uh, people with dyslexia and the role of the holistic system uh, in how they use their talent? Well, um, what, it depends what giftedness we're talking about, uh, because I, I've given you quite a few examples of uh, artists, for instance, whose holistic talent enables them, like Rodin or Picasso, to um, to produce the superior works of art. Um, uh, the holistic talent, in, in, as I was describing, uh, enables an artist to see how the composition of, let's say, his or her painting is actually going to work before even starting it. And, and uh, therefore being able to um, see how it's going to finish up in, in a more, uh, in a better way than uh, somebody who doesn't have that ability to see uh, over such a wide span of uh, attention, which is what a holistic uh, perception actually involves, a wide span of attention. La relazione tra giftedness e dislessia eh, dipende sicuramente da quale tipo di eh, talento, di giftedness stiamo parlando, in quanto se parliamo per esempio del, del talento artistico abbiamo sicuramente visto come questa eh, percezione olistica permette a, ai dislessici che hanno un talento appunto eh, nell'arte di vedere l'opera nella sua completezza, quindi eh, di vederla nella sua interezza ancora prima di essere. Realizzata. Okay, another participant asked if you should insist with reading intervention, uh, and he noticed that reading speed is improved when the child is asked to ignore the spaces between words. Claire, I'm I know, Glavon. Sorry, I've just been interrupted. What what, what was that? Uh, if you should insist with the reading intervention. Uh, so he commented that some children um, improve their reading speed if they are asked to ignore the spaces between words. Um, uh, actually, there's a, quite a lot of evidence that the opposite is the case. Um, uh the uh if you actually remove the spaces 
they are very much more, more uh, uh, upset by uh, uh, in fact there's a test uh, developed by the Swedish a Swedish group which deliberately removes the spaces and uh, but I don't think that's what you're after. What, what, what? Uh, maybe I've misunderstood. If you have larger print and more separate, then there's no doubt that that helps dyslexics. Is that what is of interest? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, there's, there's no doubt the larger print helps. Ma in realtà il professore ha citato uno studio svedese che ha proprio dimostrato che in realtà togliere gli spazi tra le lettere confonde di più i dislessici. Ok, and another question is about if you're aware of some literature studying the communication between dyslexic and the way they um, handle um, emotional conflicts and uh, there are differences in cognitive styles? Well, uh, I'd, I'm not aware of any formal studies, but there's a lot of um, uh, reports that dyslexics are uh, better at emotional interactions because of what we were talking about earlier, their empathy. Um, uh, because of their superior ability to put themselves in another person's position. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Il professore non ha al momento presente degli studi eh, scientifici che trattino questo argomento, ma sicuramente eh, rifacendosi anche a quanto spiegato eh, precedentemente, i dislessici hanno eh, ottime eh, relazioni interpersonali e questo è dovuto appunto alla loro grande dote di empatia. And the very last question uh, is about your comments on the use of uh, motor training and the body uh, in teaching and rehabilitation with students with dyslexia. Well, I'm very glad you asked that question because that's a whole another lecture. Um, I'm very interested in uh, what's called embodied cognition. And in fact, it's the idea that uh, you use your motor systems to represent cognitive situations. Uh, the best example of this is if you, um, if you listen to the word foot and you record from a person's foot area in the motor cortex in the brain, you find that simply listening to the word foot uh, activates that part of the brain slightly. So that's called embodied co cognition, though very simply. And there's now a lot of evidence, We're building actually on work done many, many years ago by um, the followers of Samuel Orton, the Orton-Gillingham approach to dyslexia, where motor activities particularly tracing uh, letters in the sand and acting out letters uh, in various ways and words helped dyslexics to learn to read. And in fact, we've done some work in which we've um, uh, simply got children to think about what they were actually doing um, in a, a rather than just doing it, actually concentrating a sort of mindfulness of uh, how they were moving, um, uh, particularly when writing. And they found, we found that it had a remarkable effect on children's ability to write, uh, or, uh, to improve their writing. So yeah, there's definitely a tie up. Um, 
Praticamente il professore sostiene appunto eh, che questa sia un'interessante domanda in quanto eh, c'è sicuramente una eh, mh, correlazione con le attività motorie e, 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 che, e che utilizza appunto anche, hanno utilizzato nel, in alcuni studi eh, anche presso eh, appunto eh, lo studio di ricerca del professore che eh, dimostrano come questa che viene chiamata body cognition eh, possa aiutare a comprendere meglio eh, eh, le parole. Ad esempio eh, vengono eh, fatti fare degli esercizi in cui gli studenti eh, tracciano sulla sabbia le lettere e le parole e poi eh, interpretano con i movimenti quanto eh, scritto e questo aiuta a, a comprendere meglio eh, la lettura. So, thank you, Professor Stein, for uh, sharing your time in responding to so many questions. But this is the proof of uh, how interesting and stimulating your speech uh, was. Thanks uh, again. Eh, ringrazio anche la dottoressa Milan che ha tradotto con notte tempo le slide e ha compiuto queste traduzioni sintetiche che penso siano state di aiuto per tutti per seguire il, il discorso. Anche ringrazio la dottoressa Cancia che ha gestito tutti gli aspetti organizzativi e vi diamo l'appuntamento a una prossima occasione di incontro e di approfondimento su questi temi. Grazie per averci seguiti in questo webinar e a presto risentirci e arrivederci. Arrivederci Thank a you. tutti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie. Is that it? <laughs>